done. It, whoa, hey everybody, welcome to the Story Studio podcast. Um, just totally distracted by stupid bullshit, but I won't go into it because I know that people really love when we when we complain to start the show. Um, <laughs> If anyway. you go to YouTube, you can get a hint, though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, I like software that doesn't work if there's an update and it doesn't tell you about the update. That's a really good design. Um, anyway, okay, so... Surprise update. I'm, di I'm disoriented, so somebody well, else. I'll take do? over because there it's been go. really fun because, you know, so we met... They've been shooting this shit while I've been yelling in the background. We met uh, Rachel at the Story Shop Summit. That's what it was called. The Story Shop Summit which story shop actually as of yesterday no longer exists if shut you up got that email yeah it's yeah really? yeah they're yeah. they're closing yeah that, that's another episode though yeah <laughs> so yeah they're 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 closing and um but they had their they had their event and rachel was a speaker and we were speakers and um it was one of those things where two things were very very evident immediately rachel is clearly our people um and dave really should have been there <laughs> because really yeah. like we were missing dave R Rachel, well i would have been there had they fucking invited me <laughs> you, no you wait, wouldn't wait, have wait, wait you were invited and they offered to pay for your no travel. they didn't offer to pay for my travel i believe that they sent you a like a engraved invitation yeah, almost. They did. it was like it was like they a did special send me an invitation but that my travel is on my ass, not them. My travel was paid for. Yeah, I, don't, I, I think your for. travel was. No, no, it wasn't. Oh, I wouldn't he's, have gone either. He's gaslighting us. <laughs> all right, all right. This, this is why I didn't go. Another episode. We need a trilogy with Rachel, apparently. <laughs> so, um, yeah, we just had we had a really good time, and we after went, you figured out who I was, that I was uh, not. Well, I did Rachel make the Aaron. mistake of thinking she was right. The the, the author of. Uh, Oh, days. I think I remember Sean being excited going in that he was going to meet Rachel. I Aaron. did. Uh, I, I walked up happens. to her and I'm like, your book changed my life. And she says, no, it didn't. <laughs> <laughs> I, watched, I watched the interaction. Sean went up. He said, it's so great to meet you. And then she said, well, I'm Rachel Heron. And Sean said, well, see you later. <laughs> <laughs> what was awesome exactly is, uh, Johnny, before you got on, um, Dave did the exact same shit. It was so awesome. <laughs> but Fuck I was you. I, I got you. to watch it this time instead of <laughs> participating. It was you weird. know what? Honestly, it works to my advantage. I've I've pitched myself for some shows where people invite me on and then they realize halfway through and it's obvious that they didn't know I wasn't the right person. Oh, you should totally right. say like offensive things and ruin her name. <laughs> <laughs> I'm gonna fight her someday. Either that or like, you know, I need to invite her on my show. So. Age match. <laughs> well, we, we had a great time and we, we went and saw Joker, which was really fun. And you could do that back in the pre-coronavirus days. You could just go. <gasps> We're not supposed to talk about pandemics. It's in the notes. No, I don't care. It was really nice to just sit in a theater next to people. Remember no that? liberals screwed now, it up. <laughs> if Dave had come, you actually wouldn't have been allowed to sit next to him because we've been to movies with Dave before and we can't share popcorn or share a row. He needs Isn't to that usually a gender thing? Like Dave would sit next to me, but he yes, would not to a guy. Yes, yeah. I no, would. no, I, I, he disagreed. <laughs> Guys are like that. You will, he will not sit next He's to you. He's just being nice to you, Rachel. No, I'm not. <laughs> no, I can tell. That's his face. Well, We're then in that time. case, fuck you, Dave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, kind, kind, of, kind of ultra fuck you, Dave. I mean, come on, man. Are you kidding me? You need another level. Like, we've known you for a decade. You haven't even met her. And we I, do pay for your travels. <laughs> what the hell? Okay, I'll sit on your lap then. <laughs> I would like that very much. We'll eat the popcorn from you. I would like a, I would like a handy while you're eating the popcorn. Wow. <laughs> All right. No, I right paid there. for your travel. Austin <laughs> theaters are weird. That's true. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's just really the Alamo. They, they, they do like you to get cozy. <laughs> They, get drunk. Very, they have rules <laughs> they do they have, they, you can't talk and and i think johnny was one of like no you seriously you can't talk you seriously oh can't. yeah they will object you. yeah like, no I, I love those I, will talk. I love them too but i was also scared for my own <laughs> safety well that's we, like we, when sean and i went to see robert mckee and we'd heard all of the like how he'll throw you out for this or that or whatever and we went in totally timid and he, he won't really throw you out. He'll, he will bore you out, but he won't throw you out. He's Take like, that, McKee. <laughs> I tried to listen to his book recently on audio and I could not do it. His voice. Oh, it, listening like, to his book on audio is impossible. exactly like listening to him for three days, but like $2,000 cheaper. Can't you speed it up? <laughs> it's good for insomnia. 
<laughs> yeah, I listened to it 2x. It oh, was a three-day thing, and the last day made it all worth it because they went through really? Casablanca minute by minute. Oh. And he, like, he would pause it every... He's like your annoying uncle who just needs to keep pausing the movie and talk and tell you stories. But it was actually awesome because this particular annoying uncle had a lot of awesome things to say. <laughs> and but he's I not liked, racist. Look at that color filler over there. <laughs> <laughs> I, liked his, uh, I liked his take on... Um, on Casablanca a lot that was really really cool um, where the other stuff was yeah I could have read your book I did read yeah book. yeah totes man so are we doing well because you kind of took the the helm so I didn't know if you, you we want to do something cool or it's just like well we, shit this is taking so long to get going oh yeah no I always like something cool um uh okay so my you, something you should cool, explain something cool so something cool is just and I, I know Rachel you've got a lot of them Tell us what you're gardening or watching or reading or writing. Um, but okay, you guys go first. Something, okay. something cool that's like from the last week. So right. my something cool would be Dave. I don't think you've seen it because you don't have Apple TV. Oh, I thought your something cool was Dave. My something cool <laughs> is always Dave. Dave is my perennial something cool. Uh, Dave, have you seen or heard anything about Servant on Apple TV? Uh, is that the M. Night one? Yeah. Uh, I have heard about it. I haven't seen it yet. It is right up your alley. It is so, you would totally <clears throat> dig it. It's, it's Shyamalan. He only does, I think, the pilot and maybe the second episode, but then he show runs the whole thing. But it's got a lot of, like, even if you, his name wasn't attached, you would know. Like, even if you didn't see the credits, you would just know. It's just kind of got his, like, slower pacing and um, okay. his camera detail. I think you would like it a lot. I'm on, uh, there's 10 episodes and I've seen six, so I'm not sure where everything goes. But just from the pilot, you would um, you would love it. You would really like what it's I'll doing. It out. And uh, it, it, it's very similar in the first episode to a short story that you wrote for Dark Crossings, but I won't tell you one because it blows a punchline that is just like, oh, that's- that's, that's M. Really Night cool. stole my story. Everyone like steals stole story. the sixth sense. You know, speaking <laughs> so, of stories that Sean loves, I did finally watch There Will Be Blood. And I'm with Dave. Like I got to the <laughs> end and I was like, I was like, why did I watch this? This guy's just a fucker and it just makes me sad for him and everything in his a, life. He is a fucker. Tell, tell me how you feel about it like two weeks from now if you think about it at all. Because that was a movie, uh, P.T. Anderson's movies are all like that. I leave the theater because I always see him in the theater and I'm like, I was so excited about this and I'm disappointed. The only one I liked in the theater, well, actually, that's not true. I liked both Boogie Nights and Magnolia. In the Magnolia, theater. I love. Yeah, Magnolia was, is one of my favorites of all time. But ever since then, I've always gone wanting it to be the next Magnolia. And I leave and I'm like, oh, that was so disappointing. And then I can't stop thinking about it or I hear the score in my head or I replay a line. Oh, no, it. It's a, it was a good movie. It's like, you remember when Bonnie was on and she said it was about something she said that I appreciated it, but I didn't enjoy it. I think it was a little like that. Although I did kind of enjoy it. Like I thought it was beautifully shot. Um, Daniel Day Lewis's performance is amazing, amazing in that, yeah. especially that end scene, which I won't, which I won't blow. But as far as like, even for why $2 did million dollars. <laughs> like why, why did I watch it though? I was just like, I was waiting for 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 a message or redemption or something. But no, he's just an asshole the whole movie, and I won't spoil the ending. But the ending is yeah, just like, PT yeah. There's the climax too, of that assholery. He's not too hip on redemption for some reason. <clears throat> That's true. All right. Who so else has something, Dave? Dave. Anything cool? Uh, the the story thing I can't talk about that we're doing this week. So. Well, that is cool. Yeah. That's so <laughs> cool, Dave. Vague and cool. <laughs> well, sh it. can I say? I don't know what we can talk and talk, not talk about on this show regarding our fiction. <laughs> yeah, that's the balls part of this. Um, I, yeah, I don't. <laughs> no, all <laughs> right then. Okay. See, I actually think that there's a hierarchy here and there's being able to talk about what we do. That's the ideal. That's where we'd like to get. And then there's uh, not talking about it at all. And then there's <laughs> what we do, which is, can I talk about it? Can I talk about it? No, don't talk about it. <laughs> all right, I'll, I'll say this. So Dave has a project that we've been talking about for years. And we finally got to, we finally started it. We're in like week three, I think, of not production, two, but thought. pre-production. Is it two? It's two? I feel like it's only two. Okay, so the end of the second week. So going into the third week and um, all we're doing at this point is a lot of world building. And um, th th this project is really special for a few reasons. <clears throat> 
something that Dave has talked about for a long, long time, but also thematically it has different things that, um, uh, so the story itself is something he's wanted to do, but there's also thematic things that he's wanted to do and everything's kind of coming together. But also we're writing this series with another author in the studio and it's kind of sideways or parallel to what we're doing. So let me thing- explain it. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Okay. So one of the things I always thought sucked about the walking dead, I, I, I feel like they had a missed opportunity. They have like Sorry. another, sh- <clears throat> no, they had another show. Uh, Fear the Walking Dead. I only saw the first season. It sucked. Uh, I understand it got better, but I wasn't, I don't know, maybe someday. Um, but they had such good characters on the regular show. Like the governor should have had his own damn show. So my idea was, you know, wouldn't it have been awesome if they started two different shows and both of these groups are the heroes of their own show? The governor is a good guy. Rick is a good guy. And eventually these two fucking clash in a way that's like, just awesome so that would have been awesome so i wanted to do the same thing with something that i can't talk about what it is but i wanted to do something similar where we're writing two different series where both groups are the quote good guys but they're not really so and it's gonna come together in a big way your your face lights up when you talk about it (laughs) Yeah, yeah. It, that's amazing. It, it's been really fun to watch him because <laughs> he, he he is motivated, and we had some uh, some sticky like production questions where Dave would have to commit to some pretty aggressive timelines, which is his kryptonite, you know, um, along with family and a few other things. So well, it's a lot of people's kryptonite. That's, that's <laughs> but he, yeah, yeah he, he he does have a hard time historically with that. And he was like, no, like, I, I want this done. I'm excited about it. And, and he is. And the ideas are great. And it's also been really interesting because Dave and I have collaborated for a decade now. And we've never brought anyone else into that process, nor did I ever think we would. It's like my wife suddenly like, yeah, go ahead. Let's fuck someone else. <laughs> and he's just kind of like been really cool with it. And it's been a learning process for sure, but it hasn't been painful at all. So no jealousy, no weird. No. Dave's monogamous. Sean is a polygamist. Yeah, I yeah. totally am. Got it's, it. It's true. <laughs> uh, Rachel, do you do you want to go next? I do, if you don't mind, go if it's last. business related. Not at um, all. No. So I am happily hybrid. I love my self-publishing because that's where I usually make money, and then I trad publish too, where I don't make money. Um, <laughs> but so do uh, you do it for prestige then? I totally do it for ego. Okay. You go in prestige. I, um, I will admit that I'm one of those people that likes to go into the bookstore and just like see it there. Um, but I've recently gone into thriller and I remember talking to you guys about that. Yeah. Um, so hopefully there's like more of a chance to sell because my traditional stuff before that was like literary women's fiction, dark, sad stuff that nobody bought. Um, so the, tr- uh, the trade paperback of the hardcover of Stolen Things is coming out in August. And not only did Target pick it up, but they're featuring it all September. Oh, so, congratulations. That's and you know awesome. what's really cool about that? Like, that's super exciting. The hardcover sold pretty well at Target, but I wasn't featured. But, but if COVID rolls around again, um, <laughs> Target is open. Target is where people get their books, right? So in September, when Wave 17 comes through. Yeah, giant congratulations. People t- will still be Bye. going to Target. Yeah, so, oh, and Bonnie says, Ray, hi, Bonnie. Bonnie is amazing. Bonnie is amazing. I would do that for ego. If I could, if I knew that I could get my stuff and I could walk into a Target, I would write a book specifically and just, I'm not going to make any money on that, but I don't think it's, I I don't even think it's a bad thing. And I'm always hoping for like, this will be the one, right? This will be the one that's discovered. Um, And you never know. Maybe it is. Maybe this is the one that will rock. I don't think it's, I don't think it's remotely a bad thing. I think that getting your name out there to more mainstream people, even if you don't make money is definitely worth something. And then they follow me over. Yeah, and it's a credit for other things you do. Like if you pitch something else, be like, oh, okay, yeah, you were in Target. That's yeah. great. Yeah, so that's my, that's my something cool. I, I, that was something very cool. <laughs> Mine is um, I started the sequel to Dead City, uh, finally, which is great. So um, that's just been a long time coming. I don't know how many people out there really know or, or, or care or for, have read it, but for us, it's for Sean and I, it's the last, there's two boxes to close after this. And so I just closed one with the inevitable and now going to close this one. And then there's two more. And um, it's nice to be back in the saddle on that too. 
how long has that one been since the last one? Long time. How many we were at Dead City, Sean? Four or five years. Oh wow, really? But, um, yeah, Johnny, yeah, but they're you, all that long though. Do like, you want to talk the- even for just like a moment about that project because that it, it's not just that you started it. There is some. Mind well, it's there. it's um okay. So so basically, Dead City. If you haven't read it, is we originally called it a zombie book, like we used to put it in supernatural horror, that sort of thing. But it's not. It's it's really um, a biological thriller because I can't the the kind of writer that I am. I can't treat like I don't like just magic. Like that's why I don't like superhero movies. Oh, Superman can fly because of the yellow sun. Like whatever. No, I need a, an explanation. So when I have zombies, like the, it's a really stupid concept to the idea of an ambulatory corpse. So I needed something that at least made sense. So it became this biological thriller with intrigue and political, you know, machinations and stuff. And so it, it's it's the book that I tend to give to people if they've never heard anything I've done and they're like, oh, like they actually perk up in a way where they aren't just humoring you and they're like oh, you're a writer, that's interesting, what can I read? Because it's like this standalone and it, I, I really like it. But it works as a standalone entirely, but we always figured we'd write more. So reopening the box is like nice, but not 100% necessary. Um, but we did decide we wanted to do it next. And, and I, was, I was all excited and I got the package because Sean wrote up the world package and everything for me. And I started to read through it and I just was like kind of triggered because I don't, want to like when I wrote Dead City the first time we were writing it in very real terms it's not just zombie hordes so it was real world based but it was fantasy because this wasn't really happening well guess what now it's kind of really happening not zombies but like there were you know things about like people hoarding supplies and you know people selling snake oil and the CDC chasing down bugs and that sort of thing and I was just like I don't know that I want to write that I don't know that I want to finish my writing day and have given because like i'm stubborn in that way too like i i don't want to give covid my attention like i'm like okay so you've already taken over my world but fuck you i'm not going to pay attention yeah, yeah. and this forces this is like me it felt like capitulating but so far with just like what four days of writing so far um i've managed to like i i notice even though i'm talking about the disease and even the spread of the disease early on and i am sort of looking in some of those ways being there with the 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 um the characters was just like, I don't know, it was familiar enough that it didn't feel like writing about our real world. So that was nice. That's awesome. That is, it is awesome. Okay, I, I don't think, excuse me. Mm. I don't think we've announced. Uh, wow, this is a professional podcast. <laughs> We're so, so awesome. This is so pro. Are. It and, only took and, us half an hour to get started. We're rolling in 20 minutes. I um, didn't put on a bra, you know? Yeah, well, <laughs> neither did they. Either. Okay. Um, None of us did. <laughs> so um, uh, this is Rachel Heron, not to be confused with Rachel Aaron, who wrote- Who would do that? <laughs> only assholes only an asshole. and or idiots. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, uh, why don't you tell us a little bit about yourself and what's what's really great about you is you, like you just said, you're kind of a hybrid author because you care about the art, you care about the money, you care about the ego. <laughs> like you like you like the whole package. I love how so, Pat you admitted that too, because I, no, I would do that totally. Yeah, ego. It, it's you, you are our people. So just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well, I think it's I think it's I think it's nice when people admit the shit that they're scared will make them look bad because it's just human. So um, I, you know, I have 27 books under my belt. I just finished the 27th. Actually, I'm working on that revision, but my editor's revision right now. I started out um, wanting to be the great American novelist, Mm -hmm. of course. And I gave that my all and I never finished a fucking book. And and then I heard about NaNoWriMo in 2006 and I'm one of the NaNoWriMo babies. Like that was my... um, first book that I'd ever written quickly and badly using the NaNoWriMo method of going super, super fast through a book. And it ended up to be my total method. That is how I work. And that's how I still work. And I love it. I'm, I'm passionate about NaNo. I'm on the writer's board. Um, even though I never do NaNo anymore, I'm always usually doing some other kind of uh, deadline in November. But um, from that, I got a book that was decent enough to kind of teach myself a little bit on revision. And then I sent that out and got an agent and a three book, de- three book deal at auction to HarperCollins with that first book. And I'm one of those people who seems like the like big success story, but I always like to break it down and say what that actually is. You know, when you 
make a six figure deal in New York for a three book contract. Everybody um, that I worked with at that point uh, wanted to know why I wasn't quitting. But when you do the math, that's about $22,000 a year um, over the course of the three years, you know, after your agents cut the feds cut and it, it being broken into three years for three books. So, um, and that's kind of how I got started. I was working 911 for a long time after I got my Master of Fine Arts, which I do not recommend, by the way. Oh, but you do have a story there. Do I? What's my story? I forgot. The best suicide you ever heard about. <laughs> oh, so oh and thought, now Dave's got I thought you meant, I thought, I thought you meant MFA is, is a story. And no, 911. Like an MFA. No, 911, I loved. I loved doing 911. I, you know, fuck the police, but um, I moved from police over into uh, fire and medical for the last part of my career. And then I used to, yeah, and then I got to do awesome things like CPR and birthing babies and stuff like that. Um, but I do have a lot of great stories. And one of them is Johnny's favorite, which was my favorite suicide, um, where a guy was fighting with his girlfriend on the street and my firefighters were there and he picked up a chainsaw and cut off his own head oh my god <laughs> all the way all the way like whoa is this in florida <laughs> no it was in dublin they've read that headline florida man shot off his own head with a chainsaw it's one of those things you don't think could happen but if i guess if you have the force and the torque you no, know, the, it, yeah, there's a lot of like there when Rachel told the story, she told it twice that I remember, and both times there was a lot you of made me. There was a lot, well, yeah, there was a lot of ensuing discussion of like, that's not how could you do that? How well, could you, like we were trying to figure out the physics of it? That's required there to live. Well, and, and the minute you bite it into your flesh, I think you'd go limp, like you'd freak right. out. <laughs> right. Like, how did he keep was going? It, it was a terribly big man. It was like a big, wide, strong man who was apparently used to using a chainsaw to his best advantage and like and it, the really nice thing is is that there are only a few case, there are only a few instances where paramedics do not have to try to resuscitate a person <laughs> well they, having they, no head is probably one, that's of, them. one of them that's like one of the three they're just like well fuck that that reminds two? me that reminds me of that scene in Friends where Rachel goes to push the button on the smoke alarm to reset it and it's like over on the floor so why isn't this working <laughs> about that one <laughs> so yeah so 911 gave me a lot of good stories and i continued to write full-time and work there like 80 hours a week um for 10 years which totally this is literally why i have premature white hair i swear to god um, you totally but, rock it though oh, thanks thanks um so four and a half years ago i was finally able to make the leap i was making enough money we paid off our debt um the only debt we had was our house which is you know for me, good debt. And I made the leap and I've been full-time ever since. And for the last three years, I've broken six figures, um, which was easy to say, but I had a lot of write-offs. But this year, oh, this is another something cool. I just did my taxes this week because, you know, we got to put them off um, because of the virus. And I finally got them done and I actually netted over six figures this year. So that was really, really exciting for me as a hustler. Um, I think we talked a lot about that when we were together. I just, I hustle so much. Yeah, let's, let's talk about that. Day. Let's talk about your, because th this isn't, this is coming from many different revenue streams. Yes, right? yes. And I love that you, I, I really love that particular cocktail in a creator when they're as in tune to <clears throat> their business side of their art as their art side of their art, and they're really yeah. able to balance it. And we balance it internally in the studio in some very specific ways. And I feel like you're balancing it in some different ways. And I'd love to talk about that. So what are the different revenue streams that you're looking at? So before I go into those, I want to say that there's something really similar in what you all do and what we talked about at the, at the conference, was, which is that you guys seem to do what you want to do. And when you accidentally go the wrong way and end up doing something you hate, you pivot, you do something yeah. else, which is super admirable and not a lot of people will do that. So um, that is something that I really try to do as soon as I get myself into something that I hate, even if it's lucrative, I will get myself out. Um, because so, that's more long-term sustainable anyway. The happier you are, the more- I wanna be happy. This, I do this to be happy. And I'm also not one of those proud people. Um, I have done too many drugs to ever go back to 911 and I would not want to. But um but I'm not too proud to go get another job if I need to. Like I will go work at Trader Joe's if the day comes when I can't make the ends meet. You know, my wife and I 
live in Oakland in one of the top most expensive places in the world to live. And I have to make half of our bills. You know, I just have to. So, um, so I'll go get a job if I need to, if it keeps me happy rather than doing something that I hate to do. But I've got my little spreadsheet right here. Um, so in 2019, I just, uh, I made $159,000, which is incredible to me. That's like crazy. And 117 net. So I wrote off 42,000. I didn't do any advertising. I am really bad at advertising. Um, but I had a bunch of other kind of write-offs. So I make money from writing for magazines. And I do think that there is still money in there. If you are willing to do a couple things, um, never take less than like $300, $300 for a 750 word essay. That's money right? Um, and those kind of paying gigs still exist. You just got to Google them. Uh, I do a little bit of speaking for money, but not very much. That was like, uh, I'm sorry. Can I stop you on the magazine thing? So yeah. are you, you, are you like, are these literary magazines where you're submitting no. stories? Is no, it no, like no, no, no. Um, I love creative nonfiction as well. So that's something I forgot to say is I write in five genres. Um, I used to write romance. That was one of my genres, but I really got sick of hetero bullshit and i don't want to write the gay stuff and i don't want to write romance i want to have romance i want to do the gay stuff i don't want to write about it <laughs> uh so i'm kind of out of the romance business but that was my first genre and then um i picked up the more mainstream fiction and um memoir i've always loved 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 i actually teach it at um, berkeley and at stanford um and what are my other genres thriller and nonfiction about writing so um, for me, the creative nonfiction, the, the short essay that is interesting about something that has happened to you. I, I, I sold an, an article for like 500 bucks after um, Barbecue Becky came out. Remember when she came out? When I she did had, not. She was one of those white Karens who had called the cops on the black people barbecue yes. in Oakland. Mm. And then, I mean, and that was really fun to write. So I kind of write things like that, nonfiction that have, that have an opinion. And people are really, magazines, online magazines like Vox and um, the medium paid articles, they're looking for first person voices that are interesting and fun. And I know that they are always looking for more. So those opportunities are out there. And I did that for free for too long. What's that about? I know, because we'll do anything to get published, right? We'll do anything to see our word somewhere. And we don't do that anymore. And you don't do that anymore. Why, well, I, why just did it, I just did it on my personal blog. I was being a little facetious. I never tried to sell it. But, um, but yeah, I mean, I was sort of- great Because that's, that's lead generation. That's Yeah, I always just wrote kind of epic, like strongly opinionated posts on whatever. But um, I didn't know you could get paid I for them. I can't imagine stuff. how that would work. I, I don't either. Of course, mine were way too long. They'd probably be like, but trim that down. I'd be like, sorry, it's 5,000 words. <laughs> Yeah, my normal, I have a, so that's, a, that's another way I get paid is I have a Patreon, um, which is a successful Patreon, and in it I write essays about, kind of about, like, it's called living the creative life kind of ideas, but um, that's bougie and silly, and really I write about whatever I want. I write about, um, I wrote recently, I went to this yoga uh, silent retreat, but I didn't actually know it was going to be a yoga retreat. I just thought it was going to be a silent meditation retreat. And I am not a small girl. I was definitely the biggest girl there. So I wrote about that and my, um, my str all of our struggles to keep the farts inside. All <laughs> we're doing yoga at a set. No one speaks for six days. The only noise you hear is on the yoga floor as people poot. Um, and, and then they can't laugh. If you sneeze, no one can say bless you. So that was an article that I wrote, I mean, it turned out, it turned out well, but um, that was for a Patreon. And so every month I send out an essay um, that will fit into a collection later um, of essays into a memoir uh, collection. And I'm kind of paying my own advance for that. And then I give the collections to my agent to sell if she can, and if not, I self publish. Um, so that is a really good revenue source. And to your point, Johnny, that's where my four and 5,000 word essays go. But you're right. Mm -hmm. All the magazines want 750 to 1200. If it's a feature, maybe 2000 words. Is Patreon worth doing for you? You said successful, but I always wonder because people have asked us about it and it always feels like it would be more work to do it than not to do it. And then it was my, my whole thing is um, trying to make more money for the, the least amount of work I could do. Uh, so 
That is That's a, a pretty winning formula right there. It's the best. It's the best. So I want to write those essays and I'm lazy. So um, my Patreon is specifically set up. It's a per thing Patreon instead of a per month thing. It's a per <laughs> thing. So if I don't deliver an essay by the 31st of the month or by the last day of the month, I do not get paid that $2,000 that comes to me. And for me, $2,000 is, whoosh, you know, I need that. Um, that's fantastic. That actually was the way I got out of my job. That was the last little bit of money I needed was to set up this Patreon. So for me, it really works. I think it would work well for y'all. Um, it is, Patreon is not a discoverability platform. People have to know about you before they give you money. But the weird thing is, and this is why I think it would work for you guys, is that people just want to support you. There are people who give me $10 a month for this essay and they never read the essay. They never download it. They just want to give me $10 a month. Um, I'm really su kind of surprised that you guys haven't done it. I've seen that sentiment, yeah, but it always feels of, like yeah, we, would ha we would have to deliver something. You don't have to deliver anything. Think about it. Um, you <laughs> Can really you don't. pay me to exist? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you're, the $1 level is we love you. There, that's, that's your payment. The $5 level is like, once a year you put their name in something or on something um i will kill your there. baby we <laughs> oh wow it went right there <laughs> in a book rachel meet dave i would, I would kill a baby she is a member of the dead baby club I love the yeah you should have heard what she was talking about before you got on no, ripping yeah. babies out i of forgot that it took me a half an hour to get on yeah, you missed the womb rating episode. We had all of our bonding time then. <laughs> it was bloody. But we actually have, so Jay Thorne and I have a podcast um, called The Writer's Well, and we have a separate Patreon for that. And we have one patron who is at our holy shit $100 level, which we don't have anything to give for it. And, <laughs> and she signed up for it because she loves us and wants to do it, you know? Um, I've got a couple of people at my hundred dollar level that I don't have to do anything for. And in fact, I was coaching at my hundred dollar level. And that's one of those things that coaching what I had probably, I think I had fifteen hundred dollar levels and I would have to talk to wow. 15 people a month. And I, I mixed $1,500 from my incoming budget because it just wasn't worth it to me to schedule <laughs> and spend time and read their work for 15 people when I wasn't. Yeah. I've done that exact away. thing, Rachel. Like yeah. my wife loves it. Like, oh, so you're just gonna throw away a few thousand dollars because you don't like it. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're, we're all really guilty of that. And it, yeah. it, uh, the reason we haven't done a, a Patreon or something like that is because we're moving too fast and we know that it'll just be another thing that we start and we'll wanna pivot out of it. And there, there are other ways that we can do it. And yeah, and there, yeah, yeah, but, but, but let me push back. It's just free fucking money. <laughs> it's just free money. And you guys have a big listenership. So don't, don't throw it all the way out. Okay, so you want to hear some of my ideas that where I work as little as possible and get paid for it? Absolutely. Always. <laughs> <laughs> so this is one I never thought would work. And it does. And it's beautiful. And I'm sorry if you can hear the cat whining behind me. Um, my wife named it Waylon. And it does <laughs> fail. It's always Waylon. It's a um, baby dying. <laughs> What we do here, man. That's what we do. Kill babies. Um, somebody's gonna write me off of their <laughs> to purchase list today. Uh, so, so I wanted to, I wanted to be somebody who could help other people with deadlines um, because um, some people I know, Dave, you don't do well with deadlines, but a lot of people do really well with deadlines, and there aren't real deadlines before you're a writer, right? So I was gonna set myself up as this like deadline bitch person i even like bought the like url deadline dominatrix yeah i was just gonna say it, the dominatrix <laughs> really, really exactly. i was gonna do something like that until every single person in my life pointed out that i'm not a bitch i can't do that so i was like okay how else could i help people with regular accountability so now on tuesdays and thursdays i do this thing called rachel says write and people pay me 39 dollars a month to write with me two hours on tuesdays and two hours on thursdays and we get together in a big zoom room and we write together. That's all we do. I give them like a little, yay, go, rah, you can do it. And then we have and a little people bit aren't of, talking and shit? No, they're not allowed wow. to. I got the mute button. It's like the Alamo <laughs> Draft House. You are all <laughs> muted. I will boot your ass out if you do not behave. Um, and, it's, and it's brilliant. And the really wonderful thing is that I show up and I get writing done because I yeah. would be too embarrassed to like, you know, do wade through email while they're all using this time to write. 
Um, another thing I do is I lead 90 days to done this class that I do online and a 90 day revision course where I just cheerlead people to get their books done and to get their revisions done. I don't read, I don't mm. comment, I don't edit. I'm just the cheerleader and I'm really good at it. And the thing I found is that I love doing it. I love cheering people on to finish lines almost more than I love writing, like not quite more, but really close and people pay me to do it. And I love it. And it's paying me more than I would, than I made um, working at Stanford. So I've actually just dropped teaching at Stanford um, at the extension program because that was a long drive and that's, those are semester long classes and that's a lot of grading. So, so what is the thing that all of your endeavors have in common is I found a way to get paid for something I would have done anyway. Yes. And as soon as I realize I don't like that thing anymore, I find a new thing to do. And without apology. Can I know? get a Patreon for bitching about things? Dude, you absolutely <laughs> Dave, you could get a Patreon. Yeah, you could, Dave, you you could, could bake Patreon it in. in. You could yeah. you could bake it in. You the Patreon's message could be I'm not gonna do shit for you. And I hate you. That's the message. I hate you all, Patreon. And then you're just you're just walking around with a basket for money. <laughs> you you could also okay, here here you guys go. Here's your Patreon for your show. Um you have no levels except the $15 level. And if you're at the $15 level, once a month, Dave will insult you on air. <laughs> In one Ooh. sentence, one sentence or less. <laughs> there. People will pay you for that. But 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 because we do four shows a month, he's gonna have like Willard Scott's birthday wish list or something. Okay. <laughs> he might have to start his own podcast just to insult people. But would that be so hard? No, the I podcast is called Dave Reading Insults. <laughs> Dave hates you all. I am I not kidding. Dave hates you all would do really well. Dave hates you all is a great title. <laughs> do you know about the show The Walking Dave? No, what's that? Oh, oh my God. It was a podcast that yeah. he, he, he was really good at keeping up until he wasn't. <laughs> and then it just died it just like unceremonious one day it was just like well that was the last episode there is no last episode i think it ends with like see you tomorrow and then, <laughs> like four years that, that was a lot of work and i didn't have a patreon you set up a patreon i'll do that shit <laughs> wait, wait 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 it was a lot of work don't you walk with a recorder and then you put the file to in the dropbox that was such a pain in the ass i had to send it to someone and it was just uh no i was uploading it on my own for a while Mm. And then there was the production. Uh, oh, and, yeah. Uh, well, Can you tell if you're seriously bitching or just like playing? This bitching. podcast is us getting something out of something we do anyway. You see, there's no actual production value or effort put in. <laughs> well, I mean, I'm the only one who does any effort. But and look, point. when we tried to make it professional, it graded against who we are. And it, and it made fun. it shitty. It wasn't just for us. People were like, I can feel it. Nobody liked the show that way. No, there's this whole thing about good enough. Nobody likes a perfectionist, you know, and I think that in our hearts, many of us writers are perfectionists. Um, and the whole idea of getting good with good enough, no, who needs production value on a podcast? The value in a podcast is us talking, right? Yeah, it's the person, it's the chemistry. Who cares about what the music sounds like or whatever? Um, yeah, so that's kind of the way I live my life. Is it good enough? Will somebody pay me to do this? And if they don't pay me, I'll walk away. And if they do pay me, but I don't like doing it, if I have that, and, and it's such a privileged place to be, and I understand that, and I recognize that. But if I have that dread in the pit of my stomach before I have to do something, I need to get out. So, okay. So a lot of what you're talking about is scaling, right? Yes. So you've what been able scalable? to scale in a really intelligent way. Okay. Yeah. This opportunity looks great for me. I'm going to capitalize on that. Okay. Now I'm going to pivot to this opportunity and shed that one like the dead skin it is, yeah. right? Yeah. Exactly. Okay. I used what, to coach and edit all the time. And I just. So, what do you recommend for someone who's just starting out? Do you think it's better for them to just focus on their craft and selling their first few books? Or, because th that's another problem with entrepreneurial minded writers, is that we're really squirrel, right? And I know that that can see that's why we haven't done something like a Patreon. It's not because it's not a good idea, it's because it feels like squirrel, because some of the bigger horizon things that we have like two years from now. Even, even putting a little bit of attention on Patreon, it seems like the dollars wouldn't be big enough considering our yeah. overhead because it's yeah. not just like, if it was just me, I, I could see totally doing a Patreon. For one person, Patreon, I think is perfect for a yeah. business. But we've got this company going on and, and yeah. you know, if a if hundred dollars comes into Patreon, 
you know, there's like 18 mouths to feed with the hundred dollars. Like it's the, the math changes. But Dave, if you want to start Dave Hates You and do this as a 10 minute podcast once a week and insult people with a Patreon, I would like to see that. I would like to see it too. He's going to register the domain. He's going to launch the blog. He's going to do some illustrations and then it'll be, he'll hang his laundry. He'll be so excited about it for like the first month. (laughs) Dave, how's that Nutribullet working out, Dave? What about your recumbent bike? Wow. I'm going to do a podcast where I fucking hate both of you. (laughs) We have an episode of the show called called Nutribullet Unboxed. It's pretty good. (laughs) Wait, what? That's another show you do? What? We no, did. It's a oh, okay. <laughs> oh, we'd do it again in a heartbeat. Dave's the one. No, 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 no. We we had another podcast, uh, worst show ever. But Dave yeah. won't do it anymore. Well, I can't record because my when family we were, is always home. When we were in Austin, the guys were telling me that I had to listen to the worst show ever, which I haven't done yet because I've been busy. But um, they were waxing rhapsodic, Dave. <laughs> D- D- Dave is wonderful. It, He's it, all our best stories. Gifts is the thing. Um, Dave really is the girl with all the gifts. Or, or oh. something like that. And I will eat your face. <laughs> He's going to explode into fungus spores any day now. <laughs> but he, he'll be so sweet. He is. Um, he, it really is a fun show. But really what it was is free therapy for Dave for an hour every Friday. Like that's, that's really what it was. So basically he got fixed. Very um, slowly. <laughs> but the, the irony is, the more fixed I get, the less funny the show is. It's, it's true. Funny. It's true. It's funny a lot less funny true. now. Oh, yeah, God. it is. He's yeah, a little healthier. And, and I think what happened is, like many other things, the virus ruined any chance of it coming back because the show was essentially Dave's um, chance to loudly bitch about his family. And now they're oh. always home. Yeah. Uh, They'll leave again. They'll leave again. And then it'll be like, he'll need worship. You know, actually, worship is exactly what you were talking about, Rachel. It's stuff we're, we're going to make fun of Dave anyway. Might as well record it. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, so what else, what else do I do well, that I like? Yeah. Yeah. So let's tell us more about, tell us more about your, your, your money here because you, you <laughs> tell us more about your money. Well, it was what you pitched. Um, I love talking about money. There's not enough transparency in this industry, period. Um, totally agree. Yeah. In industries. Well, you, so you talked about your, your landing. There's a couple of things here. So you talked about landing a three book deal. So imagine that's attractive to one part of our audience. Yeah. And then you said at another time, despite having the three book deal and it feeling like a lot of money at the time and all this stuff, you said that you do the self-publishing so that you can make money. And then, you know, you, you talked about six figure years and stuff. So can you delve a little deeper there? What are some of your secret sauce? Although don't, I will warn you that on this show in the past, we've we've given secret sauce and then it doesn't work anymore because everybody does it. So maybe be a little guarded. Oh, you know, I, I don't, I don't worry about that too much. Um, because as soon as I say this, everybody will burst into tears and turn the show off. So, um, I'll just say this, <laughs> but so, <laughs> so last year, 117 net, um, 20, wait, let me look at the actual numbers. Uh, uh, the books. Oh, um, I made 19,000, from traditional publishing and 23,000 from self-publishing. Um, so those are not huge numbers, especially when you take off um, agent fees for the traditional and taxes for all of it, right? I could not subsist on just writing. Um, and that goes back to your question that I don't think I answered, Sean, about what would I advise people to do? Um, definitely, I think getting those first few books out there is the number one most important thing to do because if you are going to go into anything like any kind of author services, which is what many of us do and then end up regretting doing, um, <laughs> you know? And, and now I- Things like that. Yeah. <laughs> well, now I've worked my way into author services doing the things I love. So, um, so that, you know, Rachel says, write, hang out with me and write for two hours. Um, because I couldn't be deadline bitch, I am now accountability queen. And every single time they meet, they have to tell me their, their goal for today and their bigger goal. And eventually they will get so tired of hearing it that they will do it. So I'm not deadline bitch, I'm accountability queen. So I, um, so I pay myself to basically do that. Um, but so, so for n- beginners, get those first few books out there. What I really, and I, let me just tell you my pet peeve, I get hit up from my, po- I have a podcast called How Do You Write? Um, and it's just interviewing people about their writing process. And I get pitched by a lot of people who have written books about how to write a book, who haven't written books. 
Yep. It's yeah, a, I maybe have seen that a few times. Why do they do that? And why do they think I would? And then they to sell like a he, three thousand dollar course. <laughs> yeah, we've seen that a Absolutely. lot. Absolutely. Why is that? But if you have three, let's just call it three good books up there, either traditional or self-published, it doesn't matter. If you have good reviews, you can do whatever the fuck you want to help people and everybody can have a niche. Um, but, but then again, like, I just believe that as writers, you guys are kind of the exception. You guys are really making it work. Um, although you do have the side hustles. We all have to have, most of us have to have side hustles. Um, my friend Sophie Littlefield needs the side hustle and she needs it to be anything that isn't writing. She wants writing just to be writing stories. Whereas I'm the opposite. I wanna do only things that have to do with words. Um, so I do that, but, but I did have to have a few books under me before I started doing that kind of thing. Um, another way I make money without doing anything <laughs> I love how you frame this too. Oh, it's so good. Actually, I do work hard on this. I, I have to admit this is hard work, um, but it's worth it. I lead retreats, um, which in the days of coronavirus is not very good, but people will pay you. So say you get two or three books out there. They've got good reviews. You can now lead retreats to Barcelona or Venice. I usually go to Venice in spring and people pay me a bunch of money to sit around. We work, we write together in the mornings. I do a little bit of teaching and then we go and explore in the night. And the only reason I do this is because I take my own week there as a writing retreat by myself with no one around. Mm. I leave my wife at home. It's my time and I get paid to do it. I will say, thank you, coronavirus, that a hotel in Barcelona right now has 20,000 of my dollars and is not giving it back yet. Oh. So mm. that, that, was, that was poor timing. Um, but again, that goes back to thinking about what I love doing. I, I was literally lying in bed one morning thinking, I, we can't afford, is that cat really bothersome? No. Can't really hear it. No, I okay. can't even hear it. Oh, good. Okay. Uh, it's bothering me. So I, I was lying in bed one morning and thinking, we can't afford for me to go to Venice. And I love Venice. And I got up and went and made a web page that said, come with me to Venice. And by two, two days later, the, it was full. And my wow. wife, my wife was like, I can't believe you're going to Venice. Like, how did you do that? And I've done that for years now. Um, because people want the opportunity to learn. There will always be more people trying to learn about writing than there will be teachers to fill it. But I think that if people are interested in someday doing that, you just have to do what you love and not sell out like editing manuscripts if you're not really good at editing manuscripts. I am not really good at doing that and I did it for a while and I fucking hated it. <laughs> okay, wait, wait, wait. Let's, let, because I, we, we do need to wrap up, but I actually like that a lot. You, that was another thing that you said, oh, I could talk about that all day. <laughs> How to make editing fun, right? Oh, so, revision, yeah. Yeah, just revision. Like that, that is uh, one other trend other than, you know, people writing how to write books <laughs> without having, yeah. you know, a pedigree behind them. That's infuriating. Another thing about this industry that really infuriates me is the whole like, eh, we can publish rough drafts. <laughs> right? or, oh my. Oh, I was going to make that joke earlier, actually. Yeah. It's just, it's, it's so barf. So I, I think that that's how you learn to be a writer is in the revision process. That's the how you way. figure out your ticks. That's, you know, it, it's a little bit different for us because we're collaborative. So, yeah. you know, I am Dave's revision process. Right, I am. Right. And then it goes to it another in. editor. Right. Yeah. But, but yeah. you know, even within that, going over your, your stuff is extremely powerful. You know, I've learned a lot from Bonnie editing my work and me going over my own work. I'm becoming much more aware of, you know, what I need to do on that pass. So what are the things that you do to make revision? The I'm not saying it should be like, you know, the most pleasurable thing you do but it shouldn't be a miserable part of the process so what do you do to make it better i think it is the most pleasurable part of the process and i teach it and i love it um because it's learnable and that's what everybody forgets to tell new writers is it is a learnable skill writing a first draft and learning story structure you can learn story structure that's a skill writing a first draft you just have to do but revision is something that you can just learn um and because I know we do have to wrap up. I have a whole process of doing it and it's all for free over at How Do You Write? I think it's episode 108. I give a chapter on revision from one of my books and it's all my particular things. Um, it's actually the thing I taught at the, at the summit, right? Before Bonnie's excellent revision thing. And they went together really beautifully because mine is more about structure. How do you set it up? How do you, how do you prime yourself to revise your novel? Um, but I really believe, I worship, at the school of post-its and I talk a lot about 
post-its. Post-its are the most magical thing, especially if you use them in the Rachel way. So I would encourage your listeners to go over to How Do You Write? And I think it's episode 108 on Revision. You need to get us. I know. You need to get a sponsorship from Post-it and work that into your... <laughs> I was literally thinking about that this week. Because that's, the other thing. that's the other thing I believe. I believe in asking for big shit and you'll get turned down 90% of the time and 10% of the time people say, okay, here you go. And we're like, what? What? I got away with it? Well, maybe I'll send something to post it. That may be our uh, business model sometimes. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it, and it works. Some of the time. Ten percent. That's all you 10% need. Of the time. You don't need a hundred percent there though. <laughs> you absolutely you don't even need five percent. You know, you just need to you need to be brave. Well, yeah, we you, call it in in here we you know, we just call it the the moonshot, right? You take a lot of moonshots and you're not going to hit them. By design, you're not going to hit design. most of them. But the ones that you hit, like damn, they pay for all the rest. I mean, we as, as artists and authors, we've already seen this model in both um, the publishing industry and the film industry. Like they make a ton of shit. A few of them pay for all the other crap. And, and books are the same way, right? Books it's are the, the same way. Yep. So is entrepreneurism. Exactly. Yep. But the, the really nice thing about being a writer and doing this, doing these kind of moonshots is it gets you very comfortable with failure. And I will say that- yes you know, 12 or 15 years ago before I really got serious about writing, I was terrified of failure. And now I'm just like, I eat it for breakfast. Oh yeah. There's you my know? podcast, Failing with Dave. <laughs> Failing with Dave. <laughs> I actually eating really dig that. Me too. I, I really dig it too. Patreon. <laughs> Patreon just for you. <laughs> oh, if anybody um, wants to look at my Patreon, it's patreon.com slash Rachel, spelled weirdly, R-A-C-H-A-E-L. And, um, and they should just give me a dollar and see what I'm doing. That's what I do for Amanda Palmer. You should also follow Amanda Palmer, that crazy, crazy lunatic. Oh, Amanda Palmer is excellent. Her book, Ask, is phenomenal. Oh, it's so good. I sh- I, she drives me crazy as a person. Really <laughs> crazy. But, and her music I don't like, but that book was so good. And I pay yeah, her a really dollar a month to watch what she does with Patreon. It's fascinating. And she gets something like $40,000 a month from Patreon. I just want to say that I don't think your way is the weird way to spell Rachel at all. It took me years to realize that Rachel on Friends was without the A, and I thought that was really fucking weird. So there you go. <laughs> That's why oh, I never I think bonded with happy. It. I did. <laughs> Nobody likes my way. It's like Michael. Nobody ever says, How do you pronounce your name, Mishael? <laughs> That's my default. I think we've had Rachel's in our in our books, and I always spell it that way. It's the older fashioned way to do it, yes. That's right. Well, thank you guys. Uh, Thank you. Well, James, thank you. It's really nice to see your face. Thank you. <laughs> Not a lot of people tell him. Nobody's that. ever said that before. <laughs> it's really nice. You're, you're, like I said before the show started, your, your face is the only one I'd expected. Neither Sean nor Johnny look like they sound. And well, what, I, what do we sound like? <laughs> you sound like a blonde surfer. Oh. From, <laughs> really? From California. Well, I, well I, okay. I can see California, that. Maybe. So there you go. Maybe. Yeah. And Johnny, I thought you were shorter, darker haired with big spectacles. <laughs> wow. It's <laughs> like you're, Harry Potter. You're much more handsome in person. <laughs> wow. Short. Wait, 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 just to make things clear, what did I sound like? Oh, I want to hear this. You sound exactly like you are, like just a grizzled, attractive curmudgeon. Okay, thank you. That is <laughs> two out of the three of us who are attractive, Sean. <laughs> Sean is also attractive, but I did not expect him to look like Ray Romano in that trip. <laughs> I do carry a lot of nose around. You you are more handsome than Ray Romano, by yeah, far. and also like so twenty too. years younger. Yeah, so, yeah. <laughs> well, either we're all handsome, or Rachel just tosses that shit around to everybody. I'm thinking lesbian. It's easy. <laughs> <laughs> There's no commitment. Like, what's it going to matter if I tell this guy he's attractive? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you very much for being on, Rachel. Um, awesome. And um, and yeah. And next week we're gonna have Jay Thorne on, who's oh, Rachel how funny. earlier. So yeah, that just that just happened. That just happened. That um, and we were gonna have him on anyway, but it just happened that we were back to back. Well, so. we've had him on before. So. We have. We have. My heart friend. He he and I. I love that man so much. He's such a good man. So if people don't know him. They're gonna enjoy that. Well, thanks so much for listening to the Story Studio podcast for all of you out there. And we'll see you next time. Sean, you have the control for video, though. Adios.
Okay. And Rachel, you can, you don't need to like leave or anything. I just, we're stopping the recording.